You are listening to Aim Higher, a Catholic podcast designed to instruct and to encourage the daily practice of our faith. Pax et bonum, peace and good to you all. Welcome to another episode of Aim Higher. I am Sister Catherine. And today's episode is a special one because joining me today is not Father Anthony. It's His Excellency, Most Reverend Charles Butler, OFM. How are you today, Your Excellency? I'm doing well, Sister. All right. Um, So the reason why I brought you on to our humble little podcast is because you wrote an article for the December Seraph called The Vigils and Eves of the Church. And I thought it was very interesting and I also thought it'd be worthwhile to have a bit of dialogue, ask some questions about it. So my first question to you is what prompted this topic? Well, I have probably anyone who's been involved in writing knows that these articles are written well before the date of publication. So uh, it happened that I wrote this article uh, just before Halloween. And so the Eve of All Hallows uh, is what prompted me to think of eaves and vigils and to perhaps do a little bit of research. Um, so I wanted to know uh, the origins of Halloween, um, the eve of all hollows, uh, but then that broadened out because it was for a December issue of the Seraph mm-hmm. to include the vigil of Christmas, uh, New Year's Eve, Christmas Eve, um, and in general the eaves. Um, and then, of course, with the eve also comes the vigil that uh, we would traditionally keep the night watch or the vigil preceding the feast. And so I thought it was something interesting that I had done a a little bit of research, uh, not a whole lot. I did pick up the Catholic encyclopedia, a couple different books, but um, it was uh, just at the spur of moment what I had on hand to do a little research and reading to, I guess, satisfy my own questions about Halloween and the Eve of All Hallows and how Catholics should be celebrating it. Okay. So how would you say Catholics should be celebrating it? Um, Well, as we, I did some research on uh, eves and the vigils, and it seems in the early days of the church, it was a common practice before every big feast that we would celebrate a vigil. Uh, The eve before, the night before, we would have a vigil and a night watch. Um, And this was greatly applauded by many of the fathers of the church. Uh, But according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, eventually uh, some scandalous things began to take place at these vigils, um, which was kind of shocking to me to hear at first, but uh, apparently the people would gather the night before a large feast in the church. They would say vespers, night prayers, Um, and they would keep a watch until midnight. And at midnight, the feast uh, would officially begin. Um, And so the eve has ended, but it was not yet time for mass. So the people would take to the streets and would begin their partying and celebration in the streets and the houses that were nearby. Um, And there was a lot of drinking and dancing and scandalous things that were going on. Um, And the To combat that, I guess the church's only recourse was to suppress so many of these eaves and vigils. Um, And so we have a relatively few um, eaves and vigils on the calendar now. So if I look at Halloween, uh, the Eve of All Hallows, the Eve of All Saints, um, I think a Catholic interpretation or Catholic idea would be that we would spend that time keeping a vigil in prayer and fasting and watching in the church, but not uh, end it at midnight but to carry it all in through the day um, with the celebration of Mass, I guess, being the highlight of All Souls Day. I just kind of got a chuckle at the idea of, you know, observing a fasting and a vigil in church and staying until midnight and then having the energy afterwards to even do some sort of celebration anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe I'm old. Um, I was always a early riser rather than staying up late, but um, it kind of feels like that was definitely more of what would you say that is um, 
more the letter of the law rather than the spirit? Definitely, that is the letter of the law. And I think wherever there's an opening, the devil insinuates himself in there to inspire people to evil deeds. And I think that's what has happened with the corruption of Halloween. What also makes me think of, you know, they kept that vigil up till midnight and then, you know, all bets are essentially off. Makes me think of the Lenten fast and how on Sundays we're not obliged to fast and how people, I heard it done, they'll stay up until midnight and in 1201, oh, I'm going to eat something because it's Sunday. And that's also, I would say, definitely following the letter than the spirit. Um, and I think it's hard to kind of convince people um, that that isn't necessarily a wise mindset in the sense that sure what's the big deal you got up and you had a snack at three o'clock in the morning um but what would you have actually gained if you hadn't done that what you know what graces could have been given to you by fulfilling that obligation instead of trying to find a workaround um well i think that it's basically a testimony that uh, we have failed. As St. Saint Paul says, we have made our bellies our God. Food has become our God so that we will get up in the middle of the night to worship food, right. uh, snacks or whatever it is, uh, rather than to truly worship God. But also because we're such a, a mindset of instant gratification and because we won't necessarily recognize as the graces come in and God working with us, with doing what he asks. But if we ate something, we're going to feel that pleasure that that moment of, you know, um, something tasty or what have you, because we get that, you know, and it's, of course, it's fleeting. It doesn't last, but we're so um, used to having what we want right now. Yeah, I've, I've never been a big fan of getting up in the middle of the night to eat. I can't well, think I of, the food is not that important well, to me. Unless I were starving, you is, know, then it, it'd be a different thing. But is, then you could wouldn't have to fast anyway. If you're starving, you can eat. It is uh, interrupting your sleep really the best thing to do. Um, and I suppose you have to kind of be careful with that mindset. Well, if you're starving, you can eat because I'm sure you can convince yourself you're starving, but I don't think there's really anyone truly starving. You might have had not as much as you would have liked, or you might have had something you didn't like, and now you can only really think about something that you don't have. Um, I mean, yeah, well, I, I know there are diabetics whose blood sugar drops and they have to eat, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't have a problem with that. And so I do realize there are medical conditions where you need to eat, but for the a healthy individual uh, to interrupt your sleep in the middle of the night to eat something just for the pleasure of eating, uh, it seems rather hedonistic to me. Absolutely. Really. Really thought about, but we, I guess we do that quite a bit. I mean, as we're getting into what a lot of people think is the Christmas season, and even when this uh, episode should go live, it's still Advent. Um, but I mean, I've read studies how really from the time of Halloween, All Saints Day, up until the new year, there's uh, an increase of illness because there's an increase of sugar. There's an increase of food, you know, more than we normally would. And I know it can be hard to decline some social obligations, but I guess where I'm going with that is... Well, as a counter argument, I might suggest that it's uh, fall going into winter. Sure. People are more inside, they're enclosed more, they're sharing germs. Also true. More intimately. Also true. It's probably so. column A and column <laughs> B. Um, but also what came to my mind was... Um, and how I lost it because that's what I do. Uh, well, maybe it'll come back. Anyway, um, see, now there's going to be a lot of dead air because I don't know. I'm trying not to be nervous. It's not like I don't ever talk to you. This is not like uh, I probably talk to you more than Father Anthony would talk to you. So, um, but um, yes, I believe there is diseases that are have their root in spiritual things. Um, too often we're looking for material things to our illness or not feeling well because of something we ate, someplace we went, some germ that we've been exposed to. Uh, but I do believe there is also a spiritual element. Um, when we are in the state of sin, I think depression easily takes a hold of us, anxiety easily overpowers us, um, and 
you know, the slightest little headache can be magnified because of some kind of uh, spiritual disorder. I don't really want to say psychological disorder, but uh, the spiritual something is wrong with our soul. Something is bothering our conscience. Um, and so I do see that uh, spiritual disorders are often accompanied by excesses. You mentioned overeating, um, the in increase of sugar intake which is, I think, biologically sound because as you go into winter, you need more carbohydrates to build up a fat reserve. But we are no longer these animals living out in the wild, Working struggling hard, yeah. to survive. Uh, our lifestyle has been greatly modified. I think for many of us, we slow down in, in certain ways. As far as activity, your schedule is probably just as busy as it was during the summer, but it's just a different kind of busy, a different expectation um because i often think oh now that we're getting into like january february i'll have more time to work on other projects but that actually isn't true because we have all the things going on well that's that's some failure in our human nature because i think all winter long when summer comes i'm going to do this job and this job and all summer long i think well i'll, I'll hold that off until winter when i'll have more time and then i can do this in the winter time <laughs> So I suppose if I really want to do more this summer, I should really start working on the 2024 calendar in January. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it'll happen. I don't know. Um, I think what I was trying to remember from before was the idea of, um, I guess, the reminder to everyone that little things do count. You know, holding off something even for five minutes, you know, something that you want is like, well, let's wait five minutes and offer it up to God. Because um, I think we get stuck in the idea we have to do really big things for it to count. But can you just, I guess, more or less, more or less verify that idea, maybe expand on it a little bit? That is very true. Um, there are no big things. Um, everything is a very small thing, and it's an accumulation of these little things that make up big things, you know, poco a poco, <laughs> you know, these little by little, we add on until we have something great. Um, if you want to, you know, stash away a lot of money, um, the way to do that is not to think, oh, one day I'm going to deposit a thousand dollars into my checking account, but it is to, you know, week after week, if I can put $10, $20 or $50 aside, um, it doesn't sound like much, but that little bit adds up relatively quickly. Um, and the same is true in our spiritual life. Um, I often point out that, you know, God doesn't care whether we do great big things or we do little things. What is important, as St. Paul tells us, is that we do whatever we do, that we do it for the love of God. Um, and too often we're thinking, oh, I have to fast like the, state, the saints did and, you know, go 40 days with a black fast, you know. Uh, I have to go out to Mount Taverna and live all alone, you know, and starve myself uh, for all this time if I have to become a saint and do something worthwhile. Um, and then, of course, the devil will suggest, oh, you are a really great sinner. You, you know, if the saints could do this, you have to do even more than that because you, you are a really great sinner. Um, and then, of course, that's building up our pride, our vanity. Um, and so I think what is more important than what we do is the spirit in which we do it. Um, and the littlest thing done in obedience to the law of God or to the superior is worth m more than any extensive fasting or hair mortification, shirts. hair shirt, penance. Um, God is pleased by us picking up a piece of paper off the floor in holy obedience because our superior said, pick that up or even just suggested, would you please pick that up? Um, and if we willingly do that for the love of God in the spirit of holy obedience, that gains merit. Um, and too often, even that, we're looking for some external thing that I can do when I think we should be looking more internally into the spirit. Um, it is not really our actions that are sinful. Um, all the things in this world that God has created, they're good. Um, the actions that accompany these things, uh, our use of these things, that is not evil. All that God has created is good, and God has created everything. Where is sin? Where is evil? It's within the heart. Um, it's not what goes into the body that defiles the man, but what comes out of his heart. 
Um, so if we harbor evil in our heart, in our mind, in our thoughts and desires, then that evil will begin to manifest itself outwardly. Um, and what we really need to focus on is not the outward actions or words, but the inward thoughts and desires. Um, I often point to individuals that, uh, where our Lord said, uh, the man who looks after a woman lusting after her in his heart is already guilty of adultery. He doesn't have to touch her. He doesn't have to speak to her. He doesn't have to even approach her. He's already guilty of adultery if he's harboring these sinful thoughts in his heart. God just judges the heart, the desire. Um, the man who harbors anger in his heart towards his neighbor, he is already guilty of murder. And our Lord makes it very clear. Um, and I point out, well, God accepts the desire for the deed in these evil locations, then logically he must also accept the good desires for the deed. Um, so when we have a desire to do something good that we're impeded for some reason, we're not allowed, we cannot do it, God will accept our desire. I wish that I could do this, but because of circumstances, I can't. Um, but it sure would be nice if I could do these good things. Um, and God will accept that desire. Um, and I think that's where we need to focus rather than, um, oh, well, I, I, I can't do this. So there's no use even thinking about it, desiring it, um, because it's useless. And I think that's our big mistake is to think that things are useless just because we can't tangibly see them or touch them. Um, we need to look within. We need to look at the spiritual aspect of things rather than the physical aspects. That's very nice. Um, so as we are approaching the Christmas season, and you brought this up in both of your sermons for the first Sunday of Advent, um, you're know, reminding all of us that it's not time to celebrate yet. And that is hard for a lot of people. Um, even if they don't go over the top of things, they're still, because the world is celebrating, which I don't really know other than commercial Christmas, you know, not even truly Christmas, but the world is already taking part and they're already, they've been playing Christmas music for weeks. They have everything decorated. Um, you know, I know it's exciting to want to go to a tree lighting to um, listen to carolers because the thing is that's not going to happen after the 20, like the 24th of December. Um, and it came to my mind how, you know, a lot of people like there's just family traditions, like, you know, the Catholic that really does want to improve, but their, their family or a family that they're married into, they have certain traditions and, Obviously, you kind of have to pick up your battles, if you will. Uh, what would you recommend for that person to really do? I mean, if they're, they're still going to have to go and participate, is there still something within that? And I, I know that there are, but I think it'll help if people hear it from you that, okay, well, you're going to go to this party, but you know where you normally would drink wine, well, don't have wine. Now, that seems very insignificant, right? But to do it for the love of God, it is significant. Yeah, it's, it's really a two-edged sword that, you know, you say, give the example of not drinking wine. Well, if someone wants to uh, offer a toast and suggest, and uh, you're going to stand out like a sore thumb if you don't drink wine, then I would suggest that you drink the wine. Okay. But you don't have to drink yeah. as much beyond that. Uh, you, can, you can join in the toast, you know, not make yourself obtrusive. Um, but as I pointed out, I think in one of my sermons, um, if you say, well, it's Advent, I'm not going to go to a Christmas party. I'm not going to go to the office party or to my relatives or friends or neighbors. I'm going to abstain from all these Christmas parties during the season of Advent. Um, and I say, if you're going to do that, and then you're going to stay home and feel sorry for yourself, poor me, look, and Bishop Giles said, I shouldn't go to a party. I said, then go to the party. Uh, you're creating a bigger offense than your self-pity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're better off participating. Or if you're going to sit home and say, well, now, see, I am so much better. See, I'm a good Catholic and all these other people are not Catholics. Uh, again, you're guilty of pride. And I would say you're better off going to the party. Um, you know, we have to look within ourselves. 
uh, going to the party, not going to the party is really an indifferent matter. Um, what is our spirit? What is our intention? What is our desire? Um, if you're going to go to the party, go to the party for the love of God. You're going to stay home, stay home for the love of God. You're going to eat, eat for the love of God. If you're going to fast, fast for the love of God. Whatever you do, just do it for the love of God. Um, and too often we get our minds all wrapped up and we're overthinking, and overthinking this. It is relatively simple. Um, you know, for social reasons, we often participate in things that we would not normally participate in. Um, but at the same time, we do draw boundaries and perhaps insignificant boundaries to the world. Um, and sometimes to us Catholics, it will seem so insignificant that it doesn't matter uh, when it actually does. You know, we can go out and have dinner with people and eat fish, choose to order fish rather than a steak mm -hmm. uh, on a Friday. And um, nobody can, will even bat an eye until we start saying, oh, well, it's Friday and I have to eat fish. Uh, why do we have to announce this? Right. Um, you know, or we go somewhere, oh, they don't have anything that's meatless. And I says, oh, come on, they don't have vegetables? Yeah. Uh, they don't have something on the table, a piece of bread? Um, you know, there is something we can do. Um, and yes, if you are in need of eating and there is nothing but the soup with the meat in it, uh, then you may eat that. Um, reminds me, I think it was uh, the Curie of ours, a story about him. His cook was fixing a pot of soup for dinner and she went to stir it and a piece of meat or something appeared in it. So she tossed that aside, started all over again, and she came back and found meat in it again. And finally she goes to the Curie of ours and explains the matter. And he says, that's okay. That's the devil mm -hmm. doing this. Uh, we will just eat it. Yeah. For the love of God, we will eat this. And here it is Friday. It's <laughs> uh, the curie of ours. And he's saying, we'll just eat this meat. The devil really hated the curie of ours. Oh, yeah. Very interesting story. I mean, I suppose the devil hates all those who strive to love God, but his story is a pretty incredible one. Um, well, I remember growing up, my dad telling us how, you know, if you go to someone's house and it's Friday, and if it's served up on your plate meat, then you eat the meat. But if there's like a choice, like a buffet, you don't you, you don't pick the item that's meat. If that means all you're going to eat are vegetables and a piece of bread, that's what you should do. Because mm -hmm. we all know that one meal of not having a full meal, what qualifies as a full meal, is not going to kill us. Um, but you also don't want to draw attention. And then I brought up in my class today the idea of, you know, not eating meat on Friday because the reason why it came up is we were going over the eight beatitudes and the eighth beatitude that talks about persecution for justice sake. And I brought up how, you know, it's going to happen sooner or later that you are going to be made fun of to some degree about your faith. And commonly it is the whole not eating meat on Friday. People, people who don't know God, don't love God, can't wrap their heads around the idea of, having to not eat meat on Friday. Like that's how terrible the church makes you do this. And I point out to her that it's not the meat itself that's sinful, but it's it's about the obedience and moreover the love because if um because we know God and we the idea of not eating meat on Friday is to commemorate our Lord's death on the cross on Good Friday. We're doing this as an act of love. And because we love God, it's not that hard. It's not that big a deal. But people just our, that's one of the things that we encountered a lot growing up. It's like, how, why should you have to do that? Well, I get to do it. It's not, that's also a, a thing that we're trying to work on. It's not how you have to go to church. You get to go to church. It is a privilege. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Well, and I think we make mountains out of molehills. Is it really a big deal whether you get your protein from beans or pork or fish? Mm -hmm. What's the big deal? We have such abundance here at least locally here in the united states and uh, we have such an abundance of food items that to me it doesn't seem like it is such a big deal but yet we tend to make mountains out of molehills i mean how many people will not eat meat on any other given day but you bring up the idea that we don't eat meat on friday it's like well that's the day we're having steak uh, oh, yeah on thursday i don't want meat but on friday i want a hamburger yeah 
I just had this craving for a hamburger on Friday. You know, I can go all week without having a hamburger, but on Friday, I just have to have it. Um, that's kind of like the Curie of our story. You know, it's the devil. It's but the temptation. Could you kind of look at that? It's just sweetie, sweetening the pot of your sacrifice. You know, if you're, if you are kind of tempted in that way, I mean, it's not, not everything's supposed to be easy. I mean, in the grand scheme of it, what we have to endure on this earth is very minute, minute yeah. but, um, but okay. then we, we can get in our way about, it. we can make it a bigger problem if we let it, if we let it fester. We can make necessity become a virtue for us. So whatever you have to do, do it for the love of God and turn it into a grace, into an opportunity to grow in virtue. Um, and it is in these little things that we're going to grow in virtue. Um, I often think that, you know, in the matter of prayer, you know, I don't have time to say a whole rosary. And I think very often we kneel down, we say a rosary. Uh, most of that time is spent in daydreaming and we're lost in this thought or that thought and what we have to do next. Um, whereas perhaps these short ejaculatory prayers uh, that we say throughout the day, many times during the day, just to draw our thoughts away from the world and back to God, um, those are most effectual. Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't say our rosary, we shouldn't have these long prayers, we need those. Mm -hmm. But if you'll notice the, I guess, the psychology or weakness, when we dedicate a time slot to God, our thoughts go to the world. Mm -hmm. And what I want to do is while we are dedicating our thoughts to the world, perhaps steal away a little moment of time for God and to bring God into our lives throughout the day. Well, and I truly believe anyone that says these short prayers and really ponders on them and means them can't help but want to pray more. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, it's just, that's how it's a buildup, um, taking the little things and they, come into greater things automatically just as the devil's not going to uh, tempt you into a big sin right off the bat it's usually the small little venial sins that we we dismiss venial sins pretty easily i talk about this in my catechism class venial sin still offends god you don't want to commit a venial sin either but if you keep thinking and dismissing oh it's not a big deal it's going to end up being a big deal before you know it mm -hmm. so um with that, talking about, I guess, really the laws of the church concerning, uh, well, fasting and abstaining, um, what would you think would be a good response to someone who deals with, I don't know, their significant other, a family member, their own children, um, with the idea of, like, how is it really, because we, we, we obey these things because God it asks us to. And if we love God, we should want to do that. But what if someone you know, in my mind is like, well, shouldn't your love for God be something more also that you're naturally inclined to but of your own doing what you want? Isn't that more of a symbol of love instead of what you are told to do? Well, um, if I were to go buy a Christmas present for someone, should I buy them what I want them to have? Or should I try to think of what do they want? Right. It is not really a gift to give them what I want. Right. It is a gift to enter into their mind, into their spirit, and even to ask them, what, what would you like? Right. Um, because we want to give something that is appealing to them, right. something that they like. And it is the same spiritually with God. Uh, we don't want to give God what we want or what is pleasing to us. We want to give God what is pleasing to God. Right. It's not that God's a dictator dictating that you must do this and there's a formal checklist you must follow. There are things that guide us, mm -hmm. and these particular laws are to guide us. And I think anyone that's got into a relationship, if even the, the side that wants to argue that, well, this, you know, this just doesn't seem like a way to actually what God is calling us to do. This doesn't sound like a truly a way to love. I think if they were really to look at their own relationship, they spend time learning about that person. What is that person like? What does that person want to do? Um, and you're learning about them to give them what they desire and not what you think. Because anyone that pu I, uh, pushes what they think you should have usually finds out very quickly that that did not work out so well. I mean, it's like buying, um, you know, your wife, you think your wife needs, um, uh, I don't know, I was trying to think of something well, I, I have an example. For <laughs> okay. years, there was a lady who would always buy 
a box of expensive chocolates for me for Christmas. And it wasn't just me, but for the fathers, the brothers, religious, these nice expensive chocolates. And I would almost invariably give them to the children. And someone pointed out these chocolates are too expensive to give to children. <laughs> Why? Uh, I don't want them. Mm -hmm. I don't really care for chocolate. It, well, I do like chocolate, but it makes me sneeze and it gives me a headache and it's just too sweet and it's too much. And, um, you know, I'll enjoy a piece once in a while and generally pay for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but to me, it was okay. I can just re-gift this, right. uh, but no one bothered to ask me, would you like me to buy you a box of chocolate? I would have told her flat out, no. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, you know, if you want to buy something for me, then don't buy chocolate. <laughs> right. I, and I think an example that popped in my head, like a man might think, you know, his wife's car, you know, you know what she'd really like? She would like that de detailed, clean, everything done to it. Um, and it's not that she wouldn't appreciate it, but as a gift, you know, you probably would have been better off getting her flowers, mm -hmm. you know, um, just knowing her. I mean, something necessarily wrong per se with that gift. It's not wrong to, um, on your own also come up with um, certain ways you want to express your love to even to God, like our own prayers. There's formal prayers that we should say, and then we have our own that we come up with, or I guess that's like the mental prayers, but it's still guided. No matter if you think about it, whether it's a worldly thing or a spiritual thing, it, there's still guide and that's like guidelines, but we've been guided into um, some sort of ideal, right? Yeah. And we look at the Our Father, the only prayer our Lord actually taught us, and it was an answer to a plea from the apostles. The Lord teaches how to pray, teach mm -hmm. us. He says, when you pray, this, this is what you should say. Mm -hmm. um, and I think perhaps it was, th these are the sentiments, the ideas that you need to um, incorporate into your prayers when you're talking to your Father in heaven, um, rather than a strict formal prayer. But if we look, you know, Catholics, we have prayer books. We have missiles filled with prayers. We've got uh, prayers that different saints have said, you know, ejaculations. We, we never tire of filling books with prayers. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people who will go through the book and read prayer after prayer after prayer and say, okay, I've said all these prayers. I said, well, you haven't really said those prayers. Well, you've said them, you've read them, mm -hmm. but you haven't really prayed them. And we have to enter into the sentiments of the saints with who wrote these prayers. Mm -hmm. We have to make the sentiments of these prayers our own. Um, it's not just enough to say, okay, I've read this, my eyes have passed over these words, or I vocalized these words, um, now I'm done. No, I have to, if I'm really going to pray, I have to try to enter into the spirit in which these prayers were written and incorporate that same spirit, those same ideas. And to quote you, quoting, I think it's St. Teresa of Avila, quality over quantity quantity yeah. so and i think if you actually truly are striving for quality you will increase your devotion and it isn't always about the number of times you said something it's about really trying to say something well and i just think if you actually try to say that because there's a, usually a saying of if you say one hail mary devoutly that's better than a hundred of them and you know mm -hmm. and i guess father anthony talked about that he had a discussion with a young a younger person is like, oh, yeah, that's all I have to do. And they said, well, if that's your mentality already, you're not going to say that one Hail Mary correctly and not devoutly. Um, you know, start with one and then try another one and another one. And I constantly am trying to bring myself to do that, even with saying the rosary, because definitely guilty as charged about distractions. But God appreciates the struggle, which I think is something we all need to be reminded of from time to time. Yeah, and uh, that's something I remind people of in the confessional quite often. You've fallen, you've sinned, okay. Um, that's not the big point here. That's not what we need to focus on. Um, and I point out our Lord on Calvary, you know, he fell repeatedly, but each time he got up. God isn't interested in our falls. He's interested in us struggling to get up. Mm -hmm. um, he wants us to have that, I hate to use the term obstinate, but that determined spirit that no matter how many times I, I fall, no matter how many times I fail, I'm going to get up. I'm going to struggle even if it kills me. I'm going to keep on. I'm going to get up, bite the bullet. I'm going to try again and try again and try again. That determination, uh, which I would 
much prefer to call that love for God, um, that no matter what obstacle gets in our way, we will continue um, until we die. Uh, we're going to continue struggling. We're going to continue striving. That is what is pleasing to God. Um, you don't have to really accomplish anything as long as you just keep struggling, keep fighting the good fight, as St. Paul would say. Um, and if we will put forth that effort, that is what is pleasing to God. And it is not shocking that God often hides any spiritual progress that we've made. Uh, we don't see any progress that we've made. And that's to keep us humble, um, to keep us struggling. Like the comic uh, example that I point out to children from time to time of an old man, a cartoon I read as a uh, seminarian. Uh, there's, I don't know if read is the right, there was a what or looked at, I guess, uh, pictures of an old man trying to get his donkey to move and he's kicking the donkey and the donkey won't move, it won't get up. Uh, so he takes a carrot, hangs a carrot on the end of a stick, a string, and he sits on top of the donkey and he holds the carrot out in front of the donkey's nose. And as the donkey takes a step forward to reach the carrot, obviously the carrot moves further. And the donkey never reaches the carrot, but he keeps reaching for it and reaching for it. Um, and I think spiritually that's, you know, the cartoon wasn't designed for a spiritual uh, message, but I give it one. Um, I think this is what happens to us in the spiritual life. Uh, we don't want to go on. We want to give up. But God holds a little carrot out in front of us. And so we reach for that carrot. And perhaps what has become so frustrating to us is that we can never grab a hold of that carrot. It's always just out of reach. And I have the hope that when this man got to his destination, the donkey got the carrot. And when I leave this world, my hope is that I will get the carrot. I will find the gates of heaven opened up to me. Um, and then I will have my reward. As long as I'm here on this world, I've got to remember to keep moving, to keep reaching. Um, you know, the spiritual writers uh, delineate the degrees of the spiritual life. Uh, each rising higher and higher like a ladder or uh, degrees, different castles, different mansions. Um, but I see, and if after you read all this, they will tell you that these different degrees are often intermixed. So while you think you are enlightened, you are actually still in the penitential stage. You're still, you still have penitential things to do, even though you can go uh, to the higher stages and they're, often quite intermixed, um, but we need to keep struggling. And I think God hides from us the advances that we've made so that we will keep reaching up higher. And no matter how high we get, there's always something higher because God is infinite. Um, and so there's always room for improvement. We can always do better. Um, and I struggled with that as a teacher with children who would hand me their work and say, is this good enough? Could you do better? No, but that's the best I can do. And I said, well, I don't think so. I think you could have done better. Mm -hmm. uh, not that I'm going to make you do it over, but we should always have the idea that, yeah, I could have done better. I could have put forth more effort. I could have put more forth, forth more care. Could have uh, aimed higher? I could have aimed higher. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but more often than not, we approach a task. I want to get it done and get it behind me. Uh, so I think we need to... Uh, remind ourselves that it's not just accomplishing the task, but doing this task for the love of God. Um, it's not just being knocked down and being humbled and humiliated, uh, but in spite of all that, to rise up and still say, I love God. Uh, and of course, all my listeners know about Job. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> Your fan base. Very nice. Well, I think that that probably is um, all I really had to ask you about, unless you had okay. anything else to add on that. No, as you can see, once you get me wound up, I can... Right, I keep can going. Go. Yep. Yeah. But I don't even know how long we've been talking, so I didn't really keep track. So okay. uh, if this is shorter than normal, I know our listeners will appreciate it, and hopefully uh, the quality is not too terrible. I'd hate to have to redo this because I thought it was pretty nice. Okay. Um, so with that, if you wouldn't mind leaving us with your blessing... Benedictio de Omnipotentes, 
Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, Descendi Super Vos, et Maria Semper. Amen. And we usually end this with a Deo Gratias. Deo Gratias.